want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. At the end, we're going to be studying a lot of the few, last few chapters. Even though you have chapter 34 in the bulletin, let me encourage you to have your Bible with you because we're going to look at several of the passages in the last, as I said, the last few chapters of this book. I lied last week. Didn't mean to, but I did. This is not the last sermon in our series of Moses. We're going to go another week. Um, it's hard to, to end this series. Sadly, this is probably the first time in my life that I have delved into the life of Moses as deeply as we have since uh, February or March. So it makes it difficult to say goodbye. Uh, his character makes it difficult to end this. The seeing the power of God so um, bluntly, just, just so blatantly in and through his life has uh, been an encouragement. But we're looking this, this morning at the death of Moses. And it's both sad and triumphant, which is typical of the death of all of God's saints, isn't it? As Paul described it in 1 Corinthians, death is an enemy. The death of loved ones inflicts indescribable pain to our hearts. There, there are no words to describe what it's like to, to deal with that. I told first service that there are several times I have thought about and even have a title for a book that I'd like to write to people who are in my position of being in ministry and losing a spouse, but I, I just find that I don't have um, at this point yet the strength to go through with it. It just hurts every time I set about trying to do it. Death's an enemy. At the same time, in the same chapter, Paul described death as victory for God's children. In another book, in, first, or in, in Philippians 1, he said, he told the people that death was better by far than living in the body. It's not even, it's like he said, it's not a close second. <laughs> death is better by far. Because when Christians die, they depart, he says, to be with Christ. And there is nothing in this world, nothing in this world that comes close. At the end of the first service, um, someone came up and told me about their Rachel Warren. I, I, I guess it's okay. She's not here, so I can talk about her. Um, <laughs> She said, our kids, our kids are getting this. She said, they'll, we'll have these times and, and, and uh, there'll be great times and one of them will say, best day ever. And she said, instinctively, one of the other kids will say, no, it's not. The day you die is the best day ever. It's like, they got it. They've got it. Because that's right, folks. That's Right. Well, we don't talk a lot about death in preaching, aside from the obvious statements that we're all going to die, and we, I think we all have learned that one. About this time last year, we started a series on 1 Thessalonians. We got into it, and we talked about Jesus' second coming and how the dead will not miss that. But as I looked back, even on my own files and, and uh, past, I... I rarely have preached a sermon about death and dying. We reserve that talk for funerals, and that's a shame, and it's a disservice to the church. And again, I think there are some reasons for it. One is because it is uncomfortable. It, it is emotionally hard because no, none of us have experience with dying. We have experience with death. Because we can't talk about death without remembering those who have died. And so it makes it hard. The second reason, perhaps, is that 
though not shying away from the subject of death, the Bible does not give us a lot of details surrounding the deaths of many of its people. We read that they died, but we don't know a lot of details about their death, save for Jesus and Moses, which should tell us something about this man that we've been looking at for the last several months. Moses, like Jesus, knew that his death was imminent. The time for Israel to cross into Canaan was near, and he knew that he was not going to join them. We looked at Numbers chapter 27 last week. The Lord said to Moses, go up this mountain into the Abarim range and see the land that I have given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. And in case there is any ambiguity about that statement, in case... Moses thought there was a loophole there or some kind of way he could fashion that. No, it gets, he's, it's more direct. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 27, 21, he's talking to the people of Israel, saying, The Lord was angry with me because of you, and he solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God has given you as your inheritance. I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan. You're about to cross over and take possession of that good land. So, so, because Moses knows his death is imminent, and, and, and I was, not everyone knows that, but Moses did, because he knows it, that makes the last events of his life incredibly important. And like Jesus, Moses sets about to put things in order, if you will. And in, in doing so, he constantly thinks of others first. Just like the rest of his life, his character is going to be revealed in his death. And it is worthy of our imitation. We have looked at Moses being a, a great speaker. We have looked at Moses being a patient man. We have seen him being a great leader. But what we have sometimes missed is what a great worshiper Moses was. He wrote a song of worship. We have it recorded in Psalm, the book of Psalms, it's number 90. And in that, in verse 12, he writes these words. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, he, he, he prays, God, teach us, Lord, how to make every day count. <clears throat> teach us how to, to not throw any of our days away. Teach us to understand what a gift every day is. Because we're not here forever. Teach us, Lord, to number our days aright. That we may gain a heart of wisdom. Moses made everyone of his days count, especially in the end, as we see. How did he do that? First of all, we see that he was incredibly affirming in these last days of his life. We saw last week how he obeyed God, even in his emotional pain, and commissioned Joshua to be the next leader. He did so, remember, he did so publicly and very honestly. Joshua was not just a figurehead or, or just a leader in waiting. Moses gave Joshua authority so the people would begin to see his leadership and eventually accept his leadership. And it, it happened. In chapter 34, verse 9, Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him, publicly commissioning him. So the Israelites listened to him, Joshua. And did what the Lord had commanded Moses. This, this affirmation of Joshua's leadership built him up in the sight of Israel. And set him on firm footing to be the next leader. In those last days, God called Moses and Joshua to the tabernacle. And he had some hard truths to proclaim, but they both needed to hear it. We have it recorded for us in chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, beginning with verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, now the day of your death is near. 
and we'll see in some, he, just, he keeps putting it in front of Moses. Not to frustrate him, but so that Moses would understand this reality and make the most of his days. The day of your death is near. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting where I will commission him. So Moses and Joshua came and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. Then the Lord appeared at the tent in a, pal- in a pillar of cloud, and the cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, You are going to rest with your fathers, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. Not the news Moses wanted to hear. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. On that day I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and difficulties will come upon them and on that day they will ask, Have not these disasters come upon us because our God is not with us? And I will certainly hide my face on that day because of all the wickedness they did in turning to other gods. Then God told Moses, I've got a song that I want you to write down, and I want you to sing this song to Israel, and I want you to teach them this song. And some of the words of this song were difficult. That's what we have recorded in Deuteronomy 32. You don't have the time to read all of that, but there's hard truths in there, but because it's true, it's helpful and necessary. But the end of singing this song we have in Deuteronomy 32, verse 44. Moses came with Joshua, son of Nun, and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. He doesn't do it by himself. He brings Joshua with him. And if they're, 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 it's like they're a co-leader at this point. And when Moses finished reciting all the words to Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. If I can't cross over Canaan with you, then you do it and do it well. Know the source of life. It's not just me and it's not even just Joshua. It's the words from God. He was affirming. Secondly, he pronounced blessings. He made every day count as he pronounced blessings. Chapter 33 is an entire series of Moses pronouncing a blessing over each tribe of Israel. Each one is a heartfelt desire to see those people grow and thrive. And then after blessing each tribe individually, he asked God to bless Israel collectively. So read with me chapter 33, beginning with verse 26. There is none, there is no one like the God of of Jeshurun, which is kind of a colloquial word for Israel who rides on the heavens to help you, and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge, and and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will drive out your enemy before you, saying, destroy him. So Israel will live in safety alone. Jacob's spring is secure in a land of grain and new wine, where the heavens drop dew. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you and you will trample down their high places. Do you hear Moses encouraging the people, blessing them, and and that blessing becoming such a a sense, building in them such a sense of, of anticipation for what lies ahead? You don't have to fear the unknown. God is with you. God is before you. It's a good land. You'll take possession. Your enemies will be defeated before you. You can anticipate this. And he blesses them with these words. If you're in a crowd of of, of Israel and you're hearing this, you know that these words are being spoken by a man who's the only leader you've known and everything this man has said has come true. What what sense of confidence are you gaining from this, this blessing? This isn't just, this isn't Moses saying, good luck. This is Moses saying, God, bless you. Sometimes that's just the best thing we can say to someone. When other words fail, it's just an an honest, authentic desire for the God of heaven, the protector of our souls, our refuge, our rock, 
my Redeemer, to bless someone. These are words of a worshiper. Finally, he's affirming, he pronounces blessings, and he issues challenges. Frankly, in large part, the book of Deuteronomy is an entire series of sermons where Moses challenges the people to faith and obedience. From chapter 1 through the end, it's, it's Moses continually urging the people and challenging them to faith and obedience. He, he doesn't leave it to their own willpower, and so in, also in Deuteronomy, he retells the law of God, which is to be their source of wisdom and their source of guidance. And it's so effective, it's, it's telling that, that when Jesus, centuries later, is on the mountain being tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, what does Jesus turn to to get him through that and to answer each temptation? All three times he goes back to Moses' sermons in the book of Deuteronomy. Every time he answers Satan, it's from Moses' words in Deuteronomy. It's funny how a man who decades earlier said he wasn't very eloquent didn't know how to speak, could preach pretty powerfully. If you're following along, go back to chapter 30, beginning in verse 11. This is some of the best stuff you'll hear. I should probably just stop after reading this. It's a great sermon. What I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. In other words, it's not too, it's not too lofty for you to understand. You don't have to have someone come down or go up to heaven and come back down with answers. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. Look, I've set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. And then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. So that you and your children may live, that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's a good sermon. Some face their death and know their time is short. And when that happens to God's children, what often, most of the time, happens is that those people do all they can to exhort, encourage, and challenge the people around them. They think of them. I think of Nancy Jones writing a series of thank yous at the end of her life. She wanted read at her funeral. And with every thank you, it was, it, was an, it, it was an encouragement to the person being mentioned. It was encouragement to the church. It was an exhortation to live a life that makes a difference in someone else's life. I didn't know that Lisa was writing something similar to that when she was in the last days. But she did. She wanted to make sure that her grandchildren knew that she loved Jesus and she wanted them to love Jesus and she listed a bunch of other things that she loved. Moses knew his time was short. 
There on the mountain you have climbed, chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, you will die and you will be gathered to your people just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor. So Moses knows what he's talking about in, num- in, in Psalm 90, verse 12, that our days should be numbered. They should be, they should be looked at as precious. Every day should be considered an opportunity. Every day is worth living for the glory of God. Every day is an opportunity to serve. Every day is God telling us you're here for a reason. Because he made the most of his days, his heart and mind were as sharp as at any other time of his life. He had, a, he had a heart, Moses had a heart of wisdom gained from the reality of his mortality. And so like Paul, Moses finished the race. He fought the good fight. He kept the faith. There was no bitterness or resentment. There was no arguing or bargaining with God. Remember when he prayed to God, take it away, let me cross over. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed that. And finally God said, we're done talking about this one. And as soon as that, that definitive word came from God, Moses turns his attention, then appoint someone, God. Appoint the next man. If I can't, find someone and appoint him. It doesn't take any amount of faith to acknowledge we're going to die. It takes great faith to die well. The book of Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses, and there's a lot we can learn there. So let's read together chapter 34. Of Deuteronomy. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev, and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. And then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said I will give it to your descendants. Now, stop for a moment. Just consider Moses' place, talking with God and hearing God saying, this is, this is what I saw. This is what, I've, this is what I knew awaited your father Abraham centuries ago, before he even knew who I was, when I called him out of out of the land of Ur. This, is, this was what I had for my people. And Moses hears that. And now he gets to see it. I've let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. We won't die the way Moses died, but I think we have in the events of his death recorded for us a lesson on how to die as Moses died. We've already acknowledged, folks, we're all going to die. Save Jesus' return, it's going to be the best day of our life. And in Moses' faithfulness, knowing he was going to die, he teaches us some things, some great lessons. I would say that he, his faithfulness meant that he accepted the reality of death. Think about it. God tells him, you're going to die on this mountain. Now go climb that mountain. Every step 
Moses takes up Mount Nebo is a step closer to his death. It, it kind of calls to mind Abraham and Isaac. Every step Isaac took, or Abraham took with Isaac, he, he's a step closer to death. At the time, he thought it was going to be his sons. That's the kind of faith Moses is exercising here. I'm marching. I'm, it's my own funeral march. Most scholars agree that Joshua wrote the end of Deuteronomy, this chapter. He would know that, jo- that, that Moses' eyes were good and his strength was with him so he could climb at 120 years old, a 3,500 to 4,000 foot peak. And he's accepting with every step that he's going to die. Solomon wrote that there's a time to be born and a time to die. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 9, it's destined for man to die once and then to face judgment. This is what Moses is is following. And we could think for a moment, well, you know what? It's 120. I mean, come on, really. Time is time. Um... I believe every death is a premature death. Every death is premature. From the beginning, it wasn't meant to be this way. But when sin entered the world, death was one of its curses. And it doesn't matter whether it's one or 120, every death is premature. Now, the good news is that for those who die in the Lord, it's entry into eternity, where there is no more dying, where there is no more curse, because of what Jesus did for us. I guess where I'm trying to go with this is that death and birth are in God's hands. And the best thing we can do is make, every, the, make, make the most of every day we have. The wise person accepts the reality of death. And I I agree with Lauren Winter, who wrote the preface to a book I've mentioned several times, The Art of Dying, when she wrote that we no longer allow people to say they are dying. Rather, they are battling an illness. Far from encouraging the perilously ill to recognize the imminence of their death, we encourage the sick and their doctors to fight death, but not to prepare for it. Most of us live far from graveyards, which we now locate on the periphery of suburbs, not in our backyards, not in places we routinely encounter. It's not always been this way. A couple of years ago, Wendy and I took the boys to Williamsburg, Virginia. I don't know if you've ever been there. We had a great time. After giving them their time with zip lines and amusement parks, Wendy and I said, it's time to actually learn something. And so we went to Colonial Williamsburg. Our boys were duly unimpressed by the fact that they were walking on the streets that Thomas Jefferson and others had walked. They're they're beyond hope. (laughs) But we saw this. If you've been to Williamsburg, you've seen this is the church in Colonial Williamsburg. It's been there centuries. And though you can't see it well, there's a faint sign of, or to the left of that church, on the, just outside the church, that you can see a, a little white pillar. That's a, that's, a, that's a marker. That's a funeral marker, or a grave marker, rather. And what's outside the church there is a cemetery. Now, if you've been to the Northeast, if you've been maybe to Europe, you know that this was, this was common practice. Right outside the church was a cemetery. And, and they didn't use stained glass back then. That was a more modern invention. So that when a preacher stood up to preach and looked out, not only did he see the people, but he saw what was beyond, and he recognized he was a dying man preaching to dying people. Trying to teach the people to number their days aright so that they may gain a heart of wisdom. To live every day like it matters. Moses' faithfulness also showed that God attends to us in our death. 
I wish I knew more, but none of us do. All we have for us is that Moses died because it was his time, not because he was tired. He was strong. He could see that land just fine, but, but God said it was time. And then God buried him. No funeral possession. It, it was all taken care of by God. And I don't know what to do with that other than to say that my conviction is that for every child of God, he attends to us. He ministers to us in our death. I think it's consistent with the biblical account. Stephen is about to be martyred. He's about to be stoned to death. And he bows down and he looks up to heaven. And what does he see? Remember? The glory of God and Jesus at the right hand of God. Right before he dies. Now that shouldn't surprise us either because we've been quoting this kind of truth most of our lives if you grew up in the church. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. I take that... <laughs> I don't know. If, if, if it's spiritual, it's also literal that God is with, beside, attending to His children on their greatest day. There's another passage from the Psalms that gets read a lot at funerals. Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I know it, I know it hurts those left behind at the moment of death, but there is something intimate between that saint and God that he could describe it as valuable and precious and worthy. God attends to us. He's with us. I don't know if you've read, it's been several, oh, a couple decades now, a book called Abba's Child by Brennan Manning. It tells a story about a man who is dying of cancer. The man's daughter was staying with him and she called the pastor to see if he could come by and visit her dad because death was near and the pastor was happy to do so. He gets there, talks with the man, he gets into this small bedroom and there's an empty chair next to the man's bed. And the pastor asked, well, were you expecting me? And he said, well, no, actually, I didn't know you were coming. He said, well, what's, why do you have an empty chair there? <laughs> and, and the man said, you know, when I became a Christian a few years ago, I struggled mightily with prayer. I didn't know how to pray. And finally, someone just said, just imagine God sitting in a chair and talk with him. So I have this chair. And I turn and I talk to God. The pastor left. A few days later, got a call from the daughter. The, the dad had, her dad had passed away. The pastor asked if it was peaceful. She said, it was, it was peaceful, but it was strange. I went, I, got, I went out of the house for a while to... To go to the grocery store, I came back, and, and Dad was not in his bed. He was on the floor, his knees on the floor, and his head was in the chair. I just, I believe God attends to us in our death. Moses' faithfulness finally teaches us that we have assurance in our death. I don't believe God took Moses, had Moses climb up Mount Nebo just to tease him. See, this is what you're missing. That is not God. But I believe that when Moses got to the top of the mountain and looked out over the promised land, I think somehow in an instant, Moses knew the rest of his journey, the culmination of his journey and of his pilgrimage, was about to come to an end. And it wasn't Canaan. Like Israel, our life, like Moses, our life is a pilgrimage. 
That's how Peter described it, remember? Chapter 1, verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers or pilgrims here in reverent fear. I think somehow at that moment, Moses probably, I got to believe he prayed for Israel and then understood he was about to reach by faith what he had always hoped for. I think that's what the Hebrew writer is telling us. In chapter 11, verse 26, when he speaks of Moses, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And it wasn't Canaan. That's why the scriptures can say in Revelation chapter 14 that blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest from their labors and their deeds will follow them. By the way, side note, I think it's interesting that God continually tells Moses, you're not going to cross into Jordan or into the promised land. But we know in the life and the ministry of Jesus that Moses appeared in the promised land, didn't he? That day when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up another mountain and there was transfigured before them and glowed as bright as the sun and with Jesus are Moses and Elijah. I think there's great assurance for the child of God in our death. Perhaps the more we talk about it from the biblical perspective, the less anxious we will be and, in fact, even look forward to it. I didn't ask your permission, Wayne, but I'm going to tell on you. We were at an elders meeting last week, and Wayne had a little thing, a little procedure on the top of his head, checking on stuff. Doctor says, you, you need a bandage over that, and Wayne said, no, it'll dry on the way home riding his motorcycle, and he goes, well, do you need a little pad for your helmet? (laughs) Wayne says, I don't wear a helmet. (laughs) Doctor thought he had a death wish. He doesn't have a death wish. He's just ready. He's just ready. So am I. Well, we need to close. And as we've done so often, we close with a New Testament passage because... It uh, affirms Old Testament truths. We turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And these words from Paul, beginning at verse 51. Listen. I tell, you the, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks, all thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. I can't think of a better prayer to end this morning with God than Moses' words. Teach us. To number our days correctly. And then we will grow wise as we make the most of each day, seeing it as your gift, seeing it as your, your good will towards us. God, we want to return the favor and do good. We thank you. We rejoice with the fact that we have a blessed assurance, a home that awaits us weary pilgrims. In Christ we pray. Amen.